news for Boeing continues. Shares of the plane maker and its suppliers are falling here on this Monday on reports that Boeing could temporarily stop production of the 737 MAX jets. Joining us now to discuss is Rebecca Walser. She's the president of Walser Wealth Management. Great to have you here with us. As you can see, shares down about 4% today. Overall, you know, year to day, the stock is actually still up and resilient. So what do you think is going through investors' minds right now as they hear more of this news every day about the future of Boeing and their, their most successful plane. Well, I hope there's a lot of concerns because, you know, Boeing ha already cut a 20% per, you know, reduction in April. So they got grounded in March, they cut 20% in April, and now they have a board meeting that's going on in Chicago as we speak, and they're thinking that the CEO has basically said it might be better for us to halt production than to do another reduction. And that's because of all of the uh, downstream suppliers. 80% of the plane is made from downstream suppliers, and it's hard for them. So they've been making payments. Their biggest downstream supplier, Aero, Spirit Aero Systems, which basically makes the fuselage, even though they reduced from 52 to 42 per month at the Boeing level, they still were paying Spirit at a 52 per month uh, run rate. Mm -hmm. So they have all of these things they need to consider. And as you saw last Thursday, the FAA came out and said, listen, Boeing is still pushing an unrealistic 2019 return to air. And so we're looking at 2020 and almost felt like, you almost felt like the FAA scolding them and saying, you are arbitrarily trying to pressure us to get 2019 as not going to happen. Right. So regulatory approval is really what's happening here. What was the basis, and, and you kind of went into this a little bit, what was the basis of their reasoning for this optimism of getting back to the air in 2019, especially considering the fact it's not just a U.S. grounding. This is an international grounding. Absolutely, right. Well, I think that it is the fact that they thought, well, we've changed the software, we've successfully implemented training changes and all of these things, so what more do you want us to do without severely, completely revamping the plane? We've changed the isolated pieces of it they, they think has caused the grounding in the first place. And so really, if a, if a company that is making these, if I, either Boeing or you know any company says, we fix the problems, let's get recertified, let's get back into the air. And um, and so I think that they were being very optimistic because this is costing them $5 billion a quarter. Mm -hmm. You know, they had a $5 billion after tax write off in quarter two. Sure. So all of these things are really a big struggle. Rebecca, we want to bring in David Shepardson over at Reuters, a correspondent there covering all things. David, it's all, uh, Boeing. David, always great to have you uh, with us. I mean, la last week was just more detail, right, on, on the, the failings, not only of Boeing, but now the FAA, and, and now with this week's uh, meeting, and we don't know how it's going to conclude. From your sources, what are you hearing? What do you think Boeing's going to do? Well, you know, you're right. We reported last night that the board was considering either another production uh, cut or a freeze, and that a free or a, a temporary stopping and until the the production or the plane is ungrounded. And that seems that's the more likely scenario of the two. But look, this the company does not have a lot of good choices here. It's now the, almost the end of the month, and uh, we're now in almost month number nine of the planes grounding, and Boeing's got more than 400 planes stacked up ready to deliver. So, and as the administrator said last week, you're talking about close to a dozen milestones that have to be accomplished before this plane uh, can be ungrounded, and then the training can be implemented by the airlines. So, you know, we saw last week that American Airlines pushed its date back to April to early April. Other airlines are almost certainly going to do the same thing. And again, that assumes everything goes exactly to plan between now and then. So I think, you know, the company is facing, you know, a series of bad choices and is now, you know, you know, you know making the best of it. David, sticking with you for a moment, in late October, I believe it was, we were talking about the impacted companies, GE and their aviation business being one of those impacted companies as they work on the engines for Boeing's aircrafts, the 737. And so what are some of the other companies that are really going to take the brunt of the hit should production actually be delayed? Uh, well, certainly Spirit Aerosystems is top of the list, one of Boeing's biggest, biggest suppliers. Uh, and then you know, really through the whole supply chain. I mean, I think the one issue we haven't really grappled with is, you know, how are these companies going to face a extended delay, extended, you know, shutdown of the plane, or we're talking potentially two, three months without any production. Uh, you know, do, will they have any recourse? How are they going to make up, uh, and how are you going to restart the, the entire supply chain once Boeing gets the go-ahead to, to do that? So, you know, it's going to be a very be a very rough time for those those Boeing suppliers. Right. And so as an investor then Rebecca on on the other side of things, 
what is the patience level, right? I mean, what's the tolerance level? I mean, it's been shocking that the stock has done so well. But if you do look back to February, we were trading at the 440 range, and now we're down to 327, 329. So there's definitely been a huge impact. And so we definitely see it. But, you know, it's just incredible that there's been this level of resiliency mm -hmm. because it's it's been phenomenal. This is their best-selling plane. Yep. This is their best-selling plane grounded for this much time. This is huge. And I just mean also for the suppliers, right? So there's a tolerance for, for the Boeing because there are, of course, only two of these major players. But what about for the suppliers, too? I mean, how, well, the, how much are investors willing to wait for this to turn around? I, I, I don't think very long. I mean, you're talking about a cash price a problem. You're burning cash, and if you're not paying your smaller suppliers, they're going to go out of business. They can't. They, they ramped up, actually, because Boeing was going to go to 50, from 52 to 57. So they ramped up, tooled up, to do more Boeings per month, 737s per month, maxes. And now they're actually cut. So it's going to be a big problem. It's a big cash problem for these smaller suppliers. If you're Airbus, how do you look at the issues that Boeing is going through continued now over several months and either a capitalize but also understand what risks could come your way if there is more regulation inserted in the process of getting your planes off the ground uh, David would love to get your thoughts on that yeah so they are gonna to try to capitalize and you're right but of course both companies are somewhat limited given the fact they've got extensive you know, so order backlogs and so yes you know they are going to you know be fighting for all these various orders and so on but you know given the reality is if you want to shift your if you get online from boeing and try to move to airbus it's still going to be quite a while before you're going to get those planes so that's really the problem with southwest bases or other other airlines and yes we want these planes we were anticipating having these planes in the fleet having far more flights by this point but they don't have a lot of good options. However, you do see airlines like Southwest saying, we are reassessing, reconsidering, should we move to Airbus? And that's, I think that's the key issue. You know, it's not so much a, a dramatic shift in the short term of people jumping from Boeing to Airbus, but does this give customers enough concern to say, hey, should we do a, a significant reassessment? In the long term, should we move more of our business to Airbus? So you can certainly see Airbus attempting to capitalize on that, but. I, th I think the jury is still out. You know, it, it is still the best-selling plane that Boeing's had, and people people do still really like this plane. You know, the pilots are still behind it in the U.S. Uh, so again, if they can get through these next few months, get the plane back up and running with the support of the airlines, the flight attendants, and the and the pilots. You know, then maybe the, the the long term impact of this is not as great as we might think. Have we heard anything internally about what's happening at Airbus, where maybe they're doubling down, tripling down on their own regulatory approvals? That they're working closer with the FAA. I mean, have they changed any of the way that they operate uh, from your reporting or otherwise, David? That you've heard where maybe they would again, you know, and. and not to make too much of a comparison here, but you know, sometimes when we have big terrorist incidents, uh, they say that the safest time to fly is right after because that's when everybody, all eyes, you know, higher scrutiny. So is this sort of a similar case here when it comes to these, to these accidents? Well, well I think the, the the big concern here on both sides of the Atlantic is EASA, <laughs> the European Aviation Regulator, has has signaled it's going to take a far more aggressive look in re-approving. The, the max to return to service. And the question is, is the FAA going to take a similarly harder look at approving Airbus planes? Because generally speaking, there's been deference to the, the country of, you know, the, the regulator where the, the entity is based to take the lead in certifying new aircraft. So we haven't seen anything new specifically in terms of, uh, in terms of, of Airbus seeking approvals, but we have seen a far more aggressive EASA. And again, uh, the broader issue here is, is does the the FAA's preeminence as the top worldwide aviation regulator, how much is that called the question? And after the dust settles from the 737 MAX, does the FAA have a, have a, a lesser role or, or does EASA or China or, or Canada uh, take a, a more aggressive role in worldwide aviation regulation? Uh, let's look towards 2020 in terms of getting this plane back off the ground. What are you looking for, particularly for investors to, again, retain their confidence in a company like Boeing and for a lot of the institutions that perhaps have the larger uh, outsized positions to not flee away from this name? 
Well, I would just like to say that I would, uh, for selfish reasons, want Boeing to keep as the global leader as, uh, versus Airbus, right? So we don't want Airbus to, to sort of creep up there. But um, absolutely, we're looking for a clear resolution from the board of how we can manage the cost burn of having 400 planes grounded that they have not been able to deliver, that have already been ordered. What is the future? What is the regulatory time frame look like? What do they need to? We've got the 17 points, so let's get that done. And so the investors can have confidence that these planes will return to the skies in 2020. Do you think it'll be the same leadership that's in place at that time? Interesting. Um, we'll have to see. It's it's a very interesting question. I, I think that FAA now and, and Boeing are going to have to work better together. And I do agree that it's going to come down to the FAA taking up more of a stand instead of just sort of outsourcing a lot of this uh, testing to the, the you know, Boeing itself. All right, Rebecca Walzer, president of Walzer Wealth Management, and David Shepherdson, who is the correspondent at Reuters covering all things Boeing. Thank you both for joining us here for today's roundtable.